Hello, everyone. My name is Ned Chair of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame, and I'm welcoming Barb Pellick from the Rottnest Channel Association. Say hello, Barb. Hi, Ned. Hi, everyone. I have a confession. How are we? Uh, uh, Barb and I know each other, and uh, I, I had the pleasure of doing the Rottnest swim one time, and uh, I have to share something with you. Um, when I registered in, in the darkness at three or four in the morning or whatever time it was, they gave me some gear. And one of the things was, um, uh, you know, sort of Rottnest Channel shirt, which that was very, very cool. And then later I got one with kind of my name on it with the year and stuff. But I thought, I'm just absolutely, I'm, I'm the king of shirts now. My name's on the shirt. And then I saw Barb's shirt. Go ahead and hold that up, Barb. <laughs> and this isn't my latest one. <laughs> and you just kind of growl a bit and say, well, you're, you know, maybe I should be local. Um, Barb, tell us about the, the modern day Rottnest Mass Swim. Give us some some feel for what the event is like. OK, it's huge. Um, this year, there's 448 solos, 169 duos and 467 teams of four. So, two two thousand eight hundred fifty seven swimmers in total. So it's absolutely a massive event. Um, the first wave, which is a wave of solos, leaves at five forty five in the morning. They leave ten minutes apart, and the last wave leaves the beach at Cottesloe at seven thirty a.m. So over two hours of just continual waves off the beach. So oh, that gives you some idea. So be before you go too far. Anybody has ever seen those um, documentaries of Antarctica where the, the penguins come in and they're, they're trying to find their, their chicks and the chicks are trying to find their mothers or their fathers for warmth or some regurgitated fish. At a certain point in Rottnest, you swim out and you hope and you pray you find your kayaker <laughs> or your support boat. So describe that, that zone of, of, of happiness and unhappiness. <laughs> you, you describe it really well with the penguins because it's pretty much what it feels like. You 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 leave the beach and you hope that you've made a plan clear with your paddler because you can't get to your paddler within the first 500 metres. So you hope that you've made your plan clear, you know, this boy at this time, along with the other 100 paddlers that are out there for that wave and you basically you spend that 500 meters head up swimming just hoping your paddler's there and once you hook up which most of the time I have I did miss my paddler once and swam straight past him um yeah and then it's down to finding a boat and that's just even harder that the the logistics of that again is even harder and that's at the 1500 meter mark so yeah you spend at least the first 1,500, two kilometres, just hoping that you can meet up with your paddler, your boat skipper, and not even thinking about the rest of the swim. And how many divorces do you think happened in that 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 period of time where <laughs> husbands and wives didn't connect or, or fiancés and didn't, didn't find each other? <laughs> I'm sure it happens a lot. I'm sure they, they sort of, there's a point where there's a lot of screaming and yelling going on in the water. <laughs> Why? Okay, that's so, the reason I don't use my husband. So we have we have thousand a couple thousand swimmers. Um, every solower's got a kayaker, and every relay's got a boat, and every solower also has a boat and kayak and a kayak. So we're talking about a thousand, a thousand kayakers, a thousand boats, a thousand and something. Yep. So there's about a thousand, and this coming year. About 1,060 boats, 1,060 kayaks, trying to meet up with the 2,800 swimmers. So well, it, you can imagine it, what, what that's like. In the year I was there, um, thankfully, you, you, you can't slap because we're distant. Thankfully, Barb was injured that year and didn't swim. So I had her kayaker and her son <laughs> in his boat. Um, and Barb was, uh, the, was, was in the boat. That was your uh, handler having having beers and, and giving me abuse or whatever you were doing so <laughs> oh no i was looking at you the whole time Ned. i was making sure you were right <laughs> so um 
the, the swim goes on to describe describe the water for us. Okay, the first, um, because you start at 5.45 in the morning, it's actually quite dark. So there's not a lot of penetration into the water with the sun. So you do swim with very dark water for probably the first couple of hours. At the 8K mark, that's where you get what's called the gauge roads. 8K to about 11K is gauge roads. It's really deep water. That's the commercial shipping lane. And in a good year... You can see the bottom there, but more often than not, and if you're sort of pointier end of the the pack, it's still quite dark. So that first half of the the crossing is really quite daunting, but then after that, you get into what we call rotto water, and it's just magic. It's 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 turquoise blue. You can see the reef. You can see fish. You can see. Um, it's just magic, it, and, and that's what we do it for, just that magical rotto water. Now, now, in fairness, Barb, there was that coral, coral head down at the bottom of the of, of the ocean, just in front of one of those red buoys that tends to smile at a swimmer for quite a long time. To describe those off those winds and those currents that, that have destroyed souls before. Yeah, look, I made it sound really inviting, and that's what we want. That is the ideal. But more often than not, especially the longer you're out there, we get what's called the Fremantle Doctor. So it's the sea breeze that generally comes in at about somewhere between 11 and 12 o'clock in the day. And from that point, it picks up the whole afternoon. This is our general weather. And it can pick up to 30 knots. And that along with the currents that actually converge around the island, the, the both of those things are there to destroy your psyche if you're not absolutely <laughs> in, in, invested in this swim. You can spend a lot of time swimming at the same, looking at the same bit of coral. <laughs> it's, it's, so, it can be soul destroying. So we had this conversation in, uh, in the sport about speed. And what I what I tell people is there's always a cutoff. Boats run out of fuel. Uh, the, the the you know the lights go out. The hotels close. The volunteers have to get back to their families. There, it's always a cutoff. And what speed does is it can often help you beat the elements. Yeah. Um, so I had a friend who had done Rutness uh, a couple of years before me, and he said to me, he said, he said I was flying. I was halfway across, and you know, two and a bit hours, and <laughs> And then I got to this spot and I looked at this rock for hours and hours and, and that <laughs> boy didn't move. So, so a couple of years later, I went out there and there's the boy and there's the rock. And, and I had a little more speed than my friend. I won't mention his name, but John Conroy was his name. And I'm looking at the rock and I said, OK, this is where John was. And I smiled and I said, this is probably the time where I don't want to breathe every stroke. I put my head down. May want to use those things hanging behind me, those feet, and kick a little bit, pull a little bit harder, and and slowly <laughs> the rock went in the distance, and I was fine. But yeah. um, I, I think for the slower swimmers, you're either going to have a really long time out there, or you're going to be coming back and yeah, home. yeah. There is a cutoff on the day, um, and in a good year, most people make that cutoff. It's I think it's about ten hours. Um, in a good year, most people make that, which is great. That's what we want. We want people to succeed. You know, they, there's an awful lot that goes into it in all marathon swims. And you want people to succeed. Number one is to do what you've set out to do. But like you say, there has to be a cutoff because of safety. And and like say, people have had enough. Volunteers have to go home. But the faster you are, the easier the conditions <laughs> the you get past you get in the lee of the island before the sea breeze hits the currents build up as the sea breeze builds up so the 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 closer to the island the less impact it actually has so it's just it's just cruel the slower people have the harder swim and it's just cruel now we did we did interview one of our honorees several years ago i believe it was tamara bruce who had a, a, a bad story about speed. Apparently she went, a, uh, went across so fast that the finish line wasn't ready for her. 
um, <laughs> on our scripts. So sometimes speed isn't everything. And then when you when you get to Rottnest Island, a relatively small island, my memory was there's one giant bar, which all of a sudden gets yep. really small when five or six thousand people decide to be in it. <laughs> Yep, yep, and that's it exactly. The um, finish is almost at the pub. So you, you you basically get out of the water, you go left for the pub, right for the coffee. So a big percentage of people take that left turn and hit that pub. And it's been, it's, it's packed. It's absolutely packed. It's so packed I actually haven't been there for a couple of years because it's just, and with COVID, um, they've they've had to limit the amount of people that go in there, but even so, you can you can barely even get to the bar. You know, if you go to the bar, you buy ten drinks because it's going to take you know another hour to get back up there. It's it's a busy 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 day, and it's the best day of the year for the pub. So to to put this into perspective, at at a certain point, there are a thousand boats jammed onto the sand. There's kayaks everywhere. There's five thousand pretty happy people. Um, there's a there's a there's a pub open, and then it slowly starts to wind down. Some of the boats go home. People get on ferries and go home. Um, I was advised uh, a, to book a year ahead of time accommodation on the island, and I yep. booked one of these uh, half star wooden sheds. <laughs> and if I remember right, you and we your family these. you and your family <laughs> stayed with me uh, for the first day. <laughs> Um, when I got up in the morning, there were people sleeping everywhere. And Rotness is um, named after uh, the Dutch named it kind of Rat's Nest, which was actually yep. for these small quokkas. And I remember yep. seeing somebody asleep on a picnic table with a quokka on his chest um, in the morning. Um, afterwards, uh, we, we spent uh, some friends, spent a week on the island. Everybody goes away. And, and I described it as kind of 1950s America. It's absolutely yeah. deserted. Everybody's walking and there's a bus that runs around the island and you'd get on the bus and you decide which of the absolutely abandoned beaches you wanted to spend the day on. <laughs> I've been in a soul on these beaches and it was just time just completely stopped. It was one of the most relaxing weeks I, I'd ever spent. Yeah. You described that really well, Ned. And you, I can't describe it better than that because that is exactly it. That night of rottenness is just absolute people everywhere part you know party party if you can't get into the pub you have a party at the accommodation which now you have to book 18 months ahead um <laughs> you you know you can wake up in the morning if you if you've managed to book somewhere you can wake up in the morning and there's half a dozen people on your veranda you don't know them but you know <laughs> it was shelter for the night um yeah clockers are everywhere because they're very friendly they're very person um, yeah, personified. They're very friendly. So they'll come out and sit on you. They'll come in and take food from you. And, you know, here's these hungover people going, oh, what is that? <laughs> the second night, the Sunday night, a little bit quieter. You can get to the bar. You can get to the pub. You could probably even have a meal there if you really wanted to. Once Monday comes around, the whole event's gone home and it's just back to the sleepy little rot nest that we locals love. Tell us it's how just things have totally relaxing. Tell us how things have changed since your first swim in 93, was it? 1992, I did a team. So um, 93 was my first solo. Back then, I missed, the first one was in 1991 because back then it was word of mouth. And I lived in a little place called Bunbury, which is about 300 kilometres south of Perth. So I wasn't in the loop of the word of mouth back then. I found out about it afterwards and, and I put it on my calendar. This is something I have to do because it just sounded like something amazing to do. So 1992, I got a team together, team of four, and we are uh, totally naive. We knew nothing. We had, we had a skipper that was a fisherman. You know, he just wanted to throw lines over the side all the time. We had no idea what we were in for. We actually had the best day. Um, I was one of the fa fastest swimmers in the team of four. And at one point, 
everybody on the boat was saying, gee, Barb must be tired. She's going backwards. So they got me out of the water, put somebody else in, and we really did go backwards. That's how strong the currents were. We had no idea. Um, but it really got me hooked. So I decided then and there that I was going to do a solo the next year. Again, totally naive. I knew nothing. I knew nothing about training. I knew nothing about nutrition. I knew nothing about the currents and the, you know, the, the skivers. I mean, it's just such a unique little stretch of water. And so I hooked up with a, another fisherman, friend of a friend, and everything went well because, I mean, there was only about 20 solos back then. So we were talking, you know small everything went well I hooked up with my my paddler we we took off we paddled paddled along and after a while I sort of was saying to my paddler well where's my skipper and we ended up doing the whole crossing without a boat because he'd gone fishing it was after that <laughs> that they brought in the rule that you had to have a boat with you you didn't have to be out in the same ocean it actually had to be with you so that's my fault that uh, they brought that rule in um, also back then, no internet, no GPS, no, um, you know, weather apps on your phone. There was none of that. It was all, almost, it was compass bearing. Rudness and doesn't have any mountains, to... does it? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a bit no, of flat, it's flat. sand. <laughs> it's flat, flat. Yeah. But you so can't you see, you can't west. see 19.75 kilometers away. No, no, you just have to take that that west bearing and, and just go for it. And, yeah, I mean, there was no, nowadays they have boys the whole way. They have a boy at, from about 10K, they have a boy every K, and then it gets down to every 500, then it gets down to every 200. There was no boys. There was just hot and slow, and then there was an island. And you had to try and navigate your way across. And... Yeah, I mean, it was good fun back then. It was good fun days. But um, just how naive we and everybody else was is just um, comparing it to now is, is really chalk and cheese. Yeah, the, 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 um, the, the, the knowledge we've got now, the tools that we've got available to us, there's even an app now that will plot your course going by your swim speed. So you can put in a swim speed and it'll tell your your skipper what course to plot and how long it's going to take you and exactly when the currents are going to change when the wind's going to change it's um yeah very different very different and but you know i'm it, part of that history a caution for people unless you're an experienced open water marathon swimmer <laughs> you think you know your swim speed but you actually don't <laughs> so, so yeah now what you what you did your 100 meters in the pool that's that's lovely no. and cute but and, and what yeah, you no. did your 5k in the pool that's cute too um, yeah and i think and even then take off 10 percent from the open water for a rot nest yeah and it, it's interesting as these swims become more popular um all sorts of additional safety measures come in so the the boy at, at 10 kilometers the boy every kilometer after that not only is the it, can the boat people clearly see him but the kayakers can see them. And for a swimmer, when your confidence is a bit low, you're now halfway. And, and I'm act, I am making progress. I've gone by a couple more of those things. I am going in the right direction. I, I am getting closer. I have yeah. to compliment you. You're the only swim yeah. organizers in the world that don't lie. Everybody else would have called it 20K. You call it 19.75. <laughs> I mean, every swim organizer lies a little bit. 20k yeah. yeah tell us what other safety it, measures have have come in in the last uh, few years oh uh, um the one year that um people had to exit the water because there was a um shark that went through so now they've got helicopters so they actually have a specific helicopter to um you know monitor any any activity that's in the water so that negates ever having hopefully that situation ever happening again um like i say there's the app so you can sort of pretty much work out where you're going and even then i mean it's really i don't know if you've seen that iconic photo of the spread everything starts very close together and by halfway they're all going the straightest line 
they're all going the quickest point, but they must be a kilometre apart. You know, it's just a great photo, that one. Um, there's all sorts of, there's about 40 officials on course. So they're there to make sure that everybody's, you know, safe, healthy, don't, you know, they um, don't need any treatment or, or whatever. Um, what else safety is there? I mean, there's the briefing before where we're very much, it's it's really drilled into the skippers to not put the, the um, boat into reverse. The swimmer swims up to the boat, the boat doesn't go to the swimmer. You know, that is drilled in over and over and over. Um, it's, it's the briefing, it keeps everything really um, safe. I mean, they go through things like stingers and sunburn, hypothermia. They go through the, the whole list of the usual list of um, marathon swimming issues that could arise. But um, it's a very safe event. There's been very, very few, considering the must be 20,000 people that have swum across as a team or a, or a solo. We've had very, very few incidents, um, thankfully. Um but, yeah, everyone's there to keep it fun, keep it safe, keep it on track, and, and hopefully everybody has a fun and safe day. So um, Perth is a, is a famous open water location. I, I put it in the same category as the island of Jersey, La Jolla, um, the, uh, the clubs in San Francisco. We'll put humble um, Kinsale, Cork, Ireland in that group. And, and I think one of the things I'm interested in is you started as a team and went to solo. Is that quite a common thing for people to, to build up their, their marathon swimming by going out as a team and going, yeah, uh, next year I'll go a duo. And the next year after that, hopefully the solo. Yeah, I think it's, it's actually really good that that option's there because it does give you a build. I mean, I went straight from team to, to solo because back then there wasn't a duo. But it gives you a, a build, and a, and that build gives you confidence in what you can and can't do. And and I actually think that's a really positive thing that the the event does. Um, the the ethos of the event is to allow solos to swim the channel, but having the teams there creates a lot of fun. It creates a lot of atmosphere. It's just such a you know the atmosphere on the beach at Cottesloe is just electric. It's just amazing. And people want to be involved. I mean, we don't have enough places for the swimmers that want to be involved in it. And a lot of them do go on from the, the team duo into a solo. And, and a lot, I think there's a very big percentage of people that do it do it that way. And it's, I think it's a great thing that we've got that available and we've got that, that pathway, I guess, to get to your marathon swim, to get to your dream swim. When I when I did the swim, Barb, it was um, you, you were guaranteed to get a solo spot if you had reasonable credentials, and then there was the um, the lottery for for teams. Yeah. What's what's happening now? Can solos pretty much still get in and and lottery for yep. teams? Yep, it, that hasn't changed. Solos who enter, every solo who enters gets a spot. We now have a qualifying swim. Um, we have to do a 10k swim in a four and four hour 15 minute cutoff so it's quite a you know it's quite a reasonable cutoff time um so that has to be a documented swim if you're not from wa where we must have six of these qualifiers potential qualifiers in the lead up to the swim um there are other swims that you can do if you've done an english channel in the last two years you know you'll get in but we do have to have um a, a qualifying swim that meets that criteria. A friend of mine came and did it for my 30th crossing in 2019. She was from Scotland and she had to do a qualifying swim in a 25 metre pool. Yep. <laughs> but she was, I mean, she had swum the English Channel. It was just outside that two year um, time frame. So she couldn't swim in the in the ocean because it was too cold. I mean, she couldn't get a reasonable temperature. She was in one of the islands in Scotland. She couldn't get a reasonable temperature to do a qualifier, but she got approval to do it in a 25-metre pool. So, you know, we can do it. So for, for people out there, the, the as somebody who organises an event, the, the qualifications are, are really critical for a lot of reasons, right? 
the last thing an organizer wants is somebody quitting the race at 2K, 5K, 10K. You don't know which direction they're going. You now have a swimmer who's probably not coming across the finish line with a chip. So you have the potential of missing somebody. And if you can't do the, the, the qualifier, your chances of having a, a safety problem are really, really big. Um, and also, if you're the slowest swimmer in the world and you're going to take 20 hours to do rottenness, you, you can't be in that mass event. It's not fair to everybody because you're going to get pulled yeah. and you're probably not going to be happy. Um, and it's, it, it's just not right. The other one that uh, Barb mentioned, I'm glad she did, and I've had this before, and I, I won't mention names on this one, but I once had somebody apply to come and do my distance week in Cork, Ireland, kind of last done a big swim at about, about 12 years ago, including the English Channel. And I said, look, I said, you're like the most dangerous person in the world because you remember being really good. And you have the confidence of somebody who remembers being really good, but you, you might not be really good now. <laughs> And I, and I made them do a qualifier. They grumbled the whole way through it. And, and they were fine. And they, they, they came. But these, um, these qualifiers, um, all you need to do yeah. is ever be involved organizing or volunteering for an event and watch the problems that happen when people yeah. can't do the distance or can't do the time. And the stress on the entire event is tremendous. And so the, the qualifiers yeah. make a lot of sense. Uh, tell us yeah. about... Um, outside of the big mass event every now and then i see somebody swim around the island or a two-way or a three-way um how do these work yeah this is where the person that's going to take the 20 hours can do a crossing they still have to do a qualifier but there isn't a cutoff they just have to be able to swim 10k there's no uh it's called an out of event crossing um i've done a double crossing out of the event uh there's rules. They're the English Channel rules. So you have to be above the high water mark. No one can touch you. Um, can't be on the water outside for more than five hours. You know, five hours, five minutes. You know, it is um, the same as the English Channel rules. But there's a lot more flexibility. You can start where you want. You can take as long as you want. Um, the the harbour master has to approve it. The, the harbour master has control over that that stretch of water because of the shipping lane. They have to approve your crossing and they have the say to get out at any time for any reason. But you can swim to Natural Jetty, which is two kilometres closer. So an out of, a, out of an, a, an event crossing is actually two kilometres closer because it's the closest point to the mainland. So, you know, it's appealing in a lot of ways because you don't have that mass event. You don't have all those people. You don't – there's a lot of – um excitement but there's also a lot of pressure being in such a big event and not everybody likes that a lot of people like the solo aspect of it or or they didn't make the cutoff for the big event so they can go back and do an out of event crossing so you know we've got that covered as well it's um yeah it's, it's a little bit more um relaxed i think uh, many of the viewers have probably been in a mass swim but you've probably not been in a mass swim where every swimmer has a kayaker and, and there's a boat associated <laughs> with, boat. Every, with every one of those. And it's a, it's a different animal. I, I remember yeah. I said to Barb, look, I don't plan on having a problem. Just keep the boat, you know, 50 to hundred meters away. Um, the kayaker, you can, you can, you know, every couple hours, bring some feed over the kayaker, whatever it's going to be. And, and I just was very aware of what else was in the water. And I said to my kayaker, just keep me away from the boats. I, I don't mind <laughs> running over a swimmer. I just don't particularly want to be bashing into boats. So it's it's a different kind of crowded. Um, and it is. you have to have a certain mental attitude about it, which is you're, you're not a prima donna when you're out there and there's 2,000 <laughs> other swimmers. It's not your special day. It can be, but you have to be a little bit different about it. Looking into the future, um, is there a maximum number of boats in Western Australia? Um, what are the what are the future challenges of the of the for the organisers of the swim? Yeah, the challenges are the numbers, the sheer interest in the swim. Because 
as it is, it's a lottery to get in. For the, for the duos of the teams, it's a lottery to get in. So what happens, we basically set a 1,000 a boats as our limit. All the... <laughs> All the, the the solos get their spot. So if their one year happened to be 800 solos, that would leave 200 places for duos and teams. So over the years, the solos are getting more and more and more. So like I say, it's 448 for next year. So that only leaves 500 boats, give or take, for the teams and the, and the duos. And the pressure from those 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 teams is getting it's getting harder to get a spot because we're getting so many more solos. But it is essentially a solo swim, and that pressure is always going to be there because there is limited the, the Rottnest Island Authority limits the amount of boats that can be on the island at any one time, and they're the ones that put the limit in place. It's not the organisers of the, the crossing, it's not the Rottnest Channel Swim Association, it's the Rottnest Island Association because of the facilities on the island, because like you say, it's pretty primitive um, and just to have that many people or more people on the day, there's issues with water supply, with, you know, Wash. moorings, with food, with beer, you know. So the Rottnest Island Authority is the one that puts the limit on the boats. Um, and that's always going to be a pressure. We need to find a way around that. I wouldn't want to be on the committee the year they run out of beer. I mean, this would be, <laughs> this would be a life-threatening situation. I also want to just uh, emphasize one of the things you said, and it's, it's, it's more and more the case in a lot of swims. Um, if you're swimming on a you know some sort of deserted beach somewhere you probably don't have these problems but the moment there's a a, a port authority a commercial boat activity then the water is not yours you can't just grab mm. your brother and say i fancy swimming from england to france or i fancy swimming out to rottenest channel because there Someone are will stop you. there are higher authorities that not only will stop you uh, they may end up with your brother's boat and, and you may end up yeah. with a serious fine. We we had a problem locally in Cork, and the <laughs> the authorities said the smallest fine they had ever given out was forty thousand euro, uh, wow. which was was kind of a a a, a, a deep gulp for the uh, people who didn't organize that swim particularly well. Um, so it's um, you know get a hold yeah. of the association early, make your plans. Um, yeah. Perth is also a, a fabulous holiday destination. It's one of the centers of open water swimming in the world. And um, to, to be yeah. on that island, having completed the swim, uh, it, it put a smile on anybody's face. It's, it's really quite an experience. Um, Barb, you also uh, a triple crown swimmer. Compare, compare the experience of, uh, of a solo mm. out, of, out of event with um, Catalina or the English Channel or something. How, does, how do these compare for you? Oh, an out of event solo for for Rottnest, apart from it being twenty kilometers instead of thirty four, um, it's not very different. Um, Catalina obviously is a nighttime swim, and that is a, a you know a challenge for people to get used to swimming at nighttime. Um, it's it's. Once you've got your skipper organised, once you've got your swim organised, once you're confident and can do all these things and, you know, with your training, with your nutrition and everything, they're really not that different. Water temperature in the English Channel, yeah, that's a bit cooler. Um, the water temperature over here at last year was 23 degrees. So, you know, that's actually getting quite warm. Um, Catalina for me was about 17. So yeah, big difference in water temperature, but there really isn't a lot of difference between them. They're just further. And once you're in the water, when you're doing a channel crossing, you don't see anything. It's not like around Manhattan where you've got, you know, <laughs> buildings to look at. There's literally nothing to see. You just hope you see some sort of wildlife under you, nice, friendly wildlife, because that's the only thing that is out there. And the... Um... I tell people when you book your Catalina slot, your chances of going at the time you've booked are, are really, really, really high. You book yeah. a slot in the English Channel and your chances of picking the day are really, really low. 
Um, in the mm -hmm. last 20 years of rottenness, have you have you had to swim pretty much on every day? We've missed one, 2007. Um, it was quite, it was wind. It was wind, the, the strong westerly wind. So we would have been swimming straight into it the whole time. Um, I was part of the, the decision to cancel that year. And it was based on the fact that solos could probably have made it with, you know, a very strong solo swimmer with a good boat and a good support crew could probably have made it. But getting team swimmers in and out of a boat in those conditions was just downright dangerous. And because it's an event, you had to cancel the whole event. And that I totally support the decision that they made on that day. It was wild. Um, when did you cancel yeah, it? Did, I, you, did you cancel it at midnight, two in the morning, the night before? At start time. Oh! <laughs> at start time. <laughs> They actually delayed the start, hoping that it was going to improve. So they delayed the start. And then half an hour after what was the original start time, the decision was made. So, yeah, there was a lot of angry people. So and this is this is, this is probably worth a, a, a bit of a conversation because e events get cancelled all over the world um, every year. And we, we recently had one cancelled in, in the UK and there was a lot of anger because the event was cancelled at five in the morning. So mm. the organizers really, really, really want the event to happen for a hundred reasons, yep. really want the event to happen. The boat people want the event to happen. The kayakers want to happen. The swimmers want to happen. Yeah. Everybody wants the event to happen. And it takes a lot to cancel an event. Now, the really mm -hmm. clever organizers, if they cancel it two days ahead of time, they get this much grief. Yeah. The night before, <laughs> yeah. They get like this much grief. When you're all greased that up, morning? you're all greased mm -hmm. up, you've got the sun cream on, your kayakers are out there bobbing around out there and you cancel it. The kayakers get more grief than it can possibly be imagined. But the, but the yeah. organizers were desperately trying to save the event while keeping it safe. And I yeah. guess my, my advice to swimmers is, as you're swimming in the in the pool or in the open water and you're visualizing the finish in the pub and standing on the podium and all that stuff thing, every now and then visualize how you're going to handle those situations with class and dignity. Yeah. How that's you're a good going point. to how you're going to go over to the organizers who are crying, put your arm around them <laughs> and tell them they're absolutely wonderful and they did it 19 years out of 20. And don't worry about it, you understand, and hope to see them next time. Because yep. if you want an event that's not going to be cancelled, go to an indoor pool. Yeah, and you, you, you're dead right because they got a lot. I wasn't actually on the committee, but because I'd had so much experience, I was part of the conversation. And they just got so much grief for it. And it's not fair. They did everything they could to try and keep that event happening. We'd had an event, um, and I think it was about, three, four years earlier, and similar but not quite so bad conditions. And only one third of the field finished because it was it was that tough. I, back then I was a five-hour crossing swimmer. It took me seven and a half hours to get across. And they learnt from that that sometimes it's just not doable. Um and I think after that crossing, they changed the risk matrix and they made it, well, tell you the truth, I don't think in that first crossing, I don't think they actually had a risk matrix. So they developed a risk matrix. And now every swim has to abide by the risk matrix. And it's 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 up front, it's set in stone. There's, there's very little um, debate on the day. It's decided the day before, the night before, now we have a go or no the night before going on that risk matrix with the conditions that are forecast. Um, and there's a lot more knowledge around now too. There's a lot more, um, you know, apps and things for, for weather forecasts and they can, they can predict more reliably further out. And all that makes it a little bit easier now to say yay or nay the night before. But 
we, the organisers, everybody really, really tried to have that event happen. And the grief that they got afterwards, just it's not fair because any event you take can be cancelled. And I would I would say to the strongest, fastest, most experienced half of the solo swimmers in any event, you swimming in the water is probably not the safety issue. It's yeah. the kayaker that flips and, by the way, loses their new $1,200 iPhone. <laughs> it's the person on the boat who falls down and hits their head. Mm. It's the yeah. captain of the boat. It, it, it's hard enough in rough water, but when you're going really slow, it's impossible to keep a boat going straight. And yeah. then when you're in the water, you're unlikely to have a problem until you hit something. You hit another swimmer, okay, they get hurt. That's what I think. Yeah. You hit a kayaker once or twice, okay. The third time the kayaker whacks you in the head, it's a problem. And then try to get out of a boat that's going up and down on a three meter swell when your legs are a bit uh, tired. This is not this is a, not not a fun, safe thing. So have a little patience, folks. Yeah, it's a recipe for disaster for the teams particularly. Like I say, most of, probably a third of the solo swimmers would have made it regardless. But the teams and being an event, we had to take all that into consideration. So, yeah, yeah. Barb, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your work on the committee. Thank you for the committee to running one of the greatest events in the world. I have, I have very fond memories, and I would say to people, if you're looking for an event in January, February, March, whenever it is, on the other side of the world, in nice warm water, uh, with a lot of happy people, go to Rotto. Come along. Yeah, come along. There's a place for you.